Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's program, which is Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day with Bob Abbott. I'm Michael Walsh. This program, this program is co-sponsored by the Yonkers Historical Society. Um, so thank you for all being here. And I just wanted to read a brief announcement about the foundation for the Yonkers Public Library. The foundation for the Yonkers Public Library has raised over $100,000 for the Yonkers Public Library since its founding in 2018 through the generous support of small don donors. Donating helps make programs like this possible and other programs at the library possible. To support the foundation, please visit ypl.org slash donate so please considering please consider donating to the foundation of the Yonkers Public Library you know they help out with all kinds of programs and services at the library and tonight I'm happy to welcome Bob Abbott who has interviewed around 200 World War II veterans and he's become and he became friends with several veterans um, and you know he's done great service for these veterans and making their stories possible so I just want to thank him and welcome him to tonight's program. Thank you Michael. Uh, yeah I've been interviewing World War II veterans since uh, about 1998 and uh, unfortunately although I did interview approximately 200 I can count on one hand the uh, number of those men who are still with us. And uh, one man in particular who I know you know, Michael, is uh, Chick Galella. Chick was born and raised up in Tarrytown, New York. He uh, was originally born and raised down in the Upper East Side of Manhattan in Harlem, around 118th Street. Moved up to Tarrytown in the 20s. And his mother was a widow. He was the oldest of uh, three. And in the height of the depression, uh, he just realized that the only way to kind of put food on the table was to uh, join the military. So he graduated from a Tarrytown High School in 1938 or 39. And he had a very, very good friend, a guy named John Moran, Haran, excuse me, Haran. They were best buddies. John was a year older. And they both signed up and were stationed out in Hawaii at uh, Pearl Harbor. And as Chick said, he said one morning, Sunday morning, he got up really early, wanted to go to breakfast early, get into town early and enjoy his weekend. And at 7.55, the, the world for him and everybody else there ended the Japanese attack. And uh, he was running down the runway of Hickam Field and his buddy was running in the opposite direction. They passed each other. They looked at each other. What in God's name is going on? I don't know. I'll see you later. And of course, they never saw each other again. But uh, Chick uh, was very, very active as a veteran up in Sleepy Hollow and very active in community affairs. At one point in time, he was honorary mayor, honorary police commissioner, honorary fire chief. Very, very active. And his whole attempt, his whole approach was to make people aware of the sacrifice of men and women and a goodly number of women who sacrificed to serve their country in World War II. And uh, for about the last 10 years or so, he and I would go down every December 6th to the Intrepid Museum down on the west side for a December 7th memorial group meeting. And uh, first time we went down was roughly about 10 years ago. And he was one of about eight or 10 World War II Pearl Harbor survivors, including a chaplain who was in the group. And the next year, the number would dwindle by one or in some cases, maybe two. And it got to a point where uh, after a short period of time, they were down to about three or four. 
And uh, that was uh, 1995. I'm sorry, excuse me, my dates are way off here by the year. 2000, 2000 excuse, 2015, there are about four or five. And he was going to Pearl Harbor the next year, 2016, for the 70th reunion, remembrance, 75th remembrance of Pearl Harbor. And Tarrytown took up a nice collection. They sent him and his family out for his class. He came back the next year and he was one of two. And he came over to me, he was very emotional. He said, Bob, he said, this is, this is really getting bad. He says, it's just two of us, two of us, that's it. The next year, he was the only one. And he got very emotional. And he said, Bob, I'm next. I just, there's nobody else to take my place. I'm the next guy to go. And he was being interviewed by a young lady from one of the uh, networks. And uh, he kind of motioned me to come on over to where he was. I went over and she kind of looked at me and she said, uh, she said, what's the matter with him? I said, what do you mean? She said, he's so emotional. She said, this happened so many years ago. He said, she said, you know, this happened 75 years ago. And I could see from her name tag, it looked like it possibly might have been a Jewish name. So I said, with all due respect, I said, can I just ask you a very personal question? I said, are, are you by any way, chance maybe Jewish? And she said, oh, yes. I said, well, let me just ask you, do you have any members of your family who were ever involved in the Holocaust? Oh, oh my God, oh yes. And I said, well, do they still talk about it? She said, oh yeah, yeah. I said, well, you know, that happened even longer than Pearl Harbor, but understandably, your relatives talk about it. I said, I'm not getting religious here. I said, but you know, Chick is not Jewish, but for him, this was in a way his, his, his Holocaust. And she sort, of, she sort of got that. So uh, the next year, he was uh, really, really upset. That was 2018. And the uh, matron, the uh, person in charge, the MC, said, we have a special surprise for uh, Mr. Galella. If you just go through the door over there across the room. And he's kind of looked at me, what's, what's going on here? I said, I don't know. I said, I open the door. And he opens the door. And on the other side of the room, in a wheelchair, is an African-American minister from Brooklyn who's a Pearl Harbor survivor. And these two guys, Chick ran over to him, hugged him, kissed him, and it was like two long-lost brothers from different mothers. And uh, that was 2018. They met again the next year, 2019. And of course, last year, 2020 with COVID, there was no get together. Chick, in addition to all the volunteer work he's done over the years, always wanted to remember his best friend who was killed that day at Pearl Harbor. And uh, several years ago, he was able to get a landing, a harbor landing up in Tarrytown, renamed in honor of his friend. It's now called Haran's Landing. And it's a nice little park, beautiful view of the Hudson River. And the next thing he wanted to do, because he's always appreciative of the Gold Star mothers, the mothers who lost sons, and in some cases, daughters in World War II. And I think he especially related to that because his mother was a widow when he was young. And he wanted to put together a remembrance, a statue, a monument to the Gold Star mothers. And uh, he was scheduled to have that done May of this year, and it was done. And it was the happiest day of his life in many respects to finally get that thing done. And in September, first week in September, Czech Galella died from COVID. And two weeks later, his African-American brother, James Blakely, also died, not from COVID, but the two brothers from different mothers are now in a better place. But that's uh, basically the story of Czech Galella and December 7th in Pearl Harbor. The other gentleman I mentioned, and uh, it's a rather long essay he put together. If anybody is interested, uh, Mike's got my phone number, he's got my email address, and I'd be happy to send a copy of that 
to anybody who's interested. But uh, the fellow was, uh, as I say, from White Plains, Frank Gallo. He was about 17 years old. And it's once again, the height of depression. He's working underground, helping to build a dam up in the Yorktown area. And uh, he sees in the paper an ad to join the army. And the idea was <laughs> go to Hawaii. It was like a paradise on earth. So he goes and he's a kind of a amateur writer and he related his experiences that day. And as he put it, that's the day when men became older men and young kids became men. It's a very, very powerful essay. And as I say, I'm, I'm happy to uh, make it available. Whenever I would meet a World War II veteran uh, or the, actually the, the way it came about is, uh, the Journal News in 1995 put together a special pullout edition of several dozen Westchester men, veterans who were in active duty during World War II. And uh, in a roundabout way, getting somebody actually who was killed in Vietnam some recognition, I came upon the concept of these men and their stories. And when I would go to visit these men, and thank them for their service. Every man said, I have nothing to be thankful for. I was just doing my duty. I, you know, I had nothing else to tell you. And uh, I would basically have that conversation with them on the phone. And then I would say to each of the men, would you consider a Medal of Honor awardee a hero? And absolutely, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, sure. I said, I, I agree. In World War II, approximately 435 medals were awarded. If those recipients had not been born, or if they had not served, we still would have been victorious in World War II. I don't like to use the word win because to me, war is not a game. But without the non-Medal of Honor awardees, we'd have been defeated. It'd be one different world. So in my humble opinion, you're a hero. And I don't want to just thank you on the phone. I want to come by. I want to meet you face to face, shake your hand, thank you in person. And the man would normally say, well, there's no need to because I have nothing more to tell you, but do what you want. And I'd go by with a little out of shake case, knock on the door, ring the bell. And invariably the man would say something to the effect, Bob Abbott, I don't know what your problem is. You need a hobby because I got nothing more to tell you. And in every case, I would simply say to the man, can I ask you, sir, one question? You know what is, what is your memory of December 7th, 1941? And in every single case, the man was transfixed and transposed back to where he was. I was, I was playing basketball. I was on the Hudson River. I was, come on in, come on in. And after a few minutes, I would say to the man, look, what you're telling me is living history. Unfortunately, it's not being taught. I haven't got a great memory. I don't take shorthand. But then we had a shake case here. I have a tape recorder. Would you mind if I record what you're telling me? And invariably the answer would be, oh yeah, go right ahead. And normally after about an hour and 90 minutes, I would leave with the man's story. I would tell the man, I'm gonna give you a verbatim transcript. I'm not gonna change a word. You want, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, it's in there. I don't edit a thing. And I'd go back and give it to the man. And that was my way of, in a way, getting the man's story and thanking him. And uh, I've come up over the years with a number of, you know, very, very personal stories and very poignant stories and some very good friends of, of the men I've interviewed. And there's so much, so much irony too. There was one fellow, Bill Lynn, he was born and raised in Yonkers. He was not a big guy, but he was kind of a wise guy. And he was always getting in trouble, nothing serious, but just, just always involved in something. It's like a little bit of a semi-juvenile delinquent. And his father said to him one day, he said, Billy Boy, the way you're going, you're either going to go to reform school or you're going to go to jail. And I'm not going to let you go to either one. So we're going down to the draft board tomorrow morning and I'm enlisting you. You're not enlisting. I am going to enlist you into the army. And the kid said, oh, okay, yeah, why not? And he was sent to Hawaii. And he thought, this is phenomenal. This is, this is paradise on earth. And he was there 1940 and through September or October of 1941. And then they transferred him back to the States. 
So in a way, he was very lucky. He wasn't there for Pearl Harbor. But he then went over to North Africa. He was captured on two occasions by the Germans. Normally, Americans who were captured by the Germans were put into stockades, put into cages. But because he wasn't big physically, he didn't represent a physical threat. A number of the soldiers in a particular unit offered to let him live with them in their tent, almost like as, <laughs> as a pet. And as I say, he had a very irreverent sense of humor. One day, the two soldiers, the two German soldiers who he was living with, went out to do whatever they were doing, and they left their guns in the tent. And Bill goes over, he picks up one of the guns, he sort of aims it around the room, the tent. One of the Germans comes in, and Bill looks at him with the gun in his hand. He says, you know, I could blow your brains out right now. And the German says, well, you'll do that to me now. He says, I got it to you in five minutes, you'll be dead. And he kind of laughed and he said, oh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding around. But he had this sense of humor that got him through a lot of the war. He landed on D-Day. And on D-Day, he went in, he was in the first or second wave and he's laying on the beach. He looks to his right, the man to his right has his head blown off. So he turns, he looks to his left. And looking to his left, he sees a GI leaning against a, a, a Jeep. And you know, the bombs are falling, the shells are falling. And he yells to the guy, hey, get down, get down. You're going to get killed. And the guy doesn't pay much attention. So Bill goes over, he crawls over, he grabs the guy, and he sort of pushes him down. It turns out the man was dead. He was just the shock of death sort of froze his body in a standing position. So Bill now goes back to where he was, doesn't want to look at the man without the head, takes his jacket off with his stencil serial number, puts it on the man. And when the day is over, he moves in, he leaves his jacket there. And uh, when the rest of the troops came by to pick up the wounded and dead, they saw his jacket and they notified his mother that he was you know, missing or killed in action. Uh, so, you know, just sort of strange, but he's a guy who, you know, avoided Pearl Harbor, but, you know, he didn't, he, he didn't have a, an easy go of it. But uh, those are just some of the guys that uh, were there. And uh, one, one fellow, a guy named Dick Baker, uh, December 7, 1941, he was in the polo grounds watching a football game between the New York Giants and I believe it was some football team from Brooklyn, but they were playing in the polo grounds. And the announcement came over the loudspeaker that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Now, Dick Baker grew up in rural Georgia. And as he said to me also that a lot of what he ate, he killed because he was in a rural area and he would shoot squirrel and deer and venison and cook it and eat it. And he was a good shot. And he said what he wanted to do was to kill as many Japanese in the South Pacific and retribution for December 7th as possible. So in those days, there were no cell phones. He decides at the age of 16 to go down to Times Square to be first in line in the morning to enlist in the Marine Corps. And he's there all night. And once again, uh, oh, just a little background. His mother was married, but they got divorced. So his mother moved to New York. That's how come he was at the polar grounds. But he goes into the Marine Corps station in the morning and they ask him his background and how old he is. When they hear he's 16, the recruiter says, get the hell out of here. He says, go across the street, go to the army. So he goes across the street to the army. They ask him his background. He mentions the fact his mother's a nurse. And when they hear that, they say, oh, we can use you. We're going to make you a medic. So they make him a medic. And he ends up, as opposed to going down to the South Pacific and killing as many Japanese as he can to going to the Battle of the Bulge and saving as many, as many Americans as he can. And uh, when I met him, he lived up around Mayapak. Uh, he was somewhat physically incapacitated. He was lying on a sofa and he was in some discomfort. And he said to me, he said, you know, the biggest mistake of my life well, because when he when he when he got home that morning from uh, being in the city that Sunday morning or that that Monday morning when he came back, and I apologize for the, 
discrepancies here. The only thing he wanted to do was go to sleep. And his mother, understandably, was furious because she he was gone all night. She had no idea where he was, if he was safe or not. And he was going to Fordham Prep. And he said to his mother, I just want to take a nap. And she said, no way. You're going to school today. I have been up all night. I, you didn't tell me where you were. I have no sympathy. You go to school. So he's in his classroom. He's a junior at Fordham Prep. He's in the back of the room. He's sort of half nodding off. And one of the teachers comes over, smacks him on the back of the shoulder. Hey, Baker, wake up. What, what's the problem here? And he says, oh, I was just kind of looking out the window, thinking about those poor guys that were killed over there in Pearl Harbor yesterday. Get out of here. Come back when you're ready to learn. He never did go back. And he said to me, the biggest mistake in his life was never going back to Florida Prep and finishing up with his high school diploma. So I went down to Florida Prep, and I spoke with the principal. And I spoke with the Jesuit, who is the, the president of the universe of the uh, of the prep, and I told them Dick, Dick Baker's story, and they said we'd be honored to award him an honorary high school diploma anytime you want to bring him down. And I said, well, unfortunately, he doesn't, he, he can't travel, I, but I'd be more than happy to drive you gentlemen up. So about two weeks later, we drove up, we gave Dick Baker his honorary Florida prep diploma, and as he said in front of his friends and some of his neighbors, it was one of the proudest days of his life. So uh, that's another gentleman and, you know, how he sort of interacted with December 7th, 1941. Another man who uh, was working that day, John Guthrie from uh, New Rochelle, John African-American. He was working in the bowels of the Waldorf Astoria in the kitchen, cleaning dishes, washing dishes, drying dishes. And when he heard about Pearl Harbor, the next day he went to volunteer. But because he was African-American, they wouldn't uh, allow him to train as a soldier. He was going to be in service. He was going to clean dishes. He was going to be in canteens. But when he landed on D-Day with all of the troops he was with who had their rifles, he was given a pistol. He had a pistol to fight the Germans. And uh, once he got onto the ground and moved up a bit, and there were a lot of dead Americans, and he saw a dead American, the rifle was laying there. He picked that rifle up, and he never used his pistol again. And uh, he was involved in some very heavy fighting. Near the end of the war, he also was involved in uh, the invasion of uh, Germany, and they were cleaning out bunkers at the time. And he was with a squad of about nine to 10 men. And they cleaned out this German bunker and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a German soldier comes with a modified flamethrower and points it and shoots it into the bunker. Every man in the bunker, with the exception of John, was burned and died. John was lucky, unquote, lucky. He was only burned over about 40% of his body. And he was in an army hospital in Germany, recuperating, been in there for about six weeks, and one day, this very gruff sounding officer comes on by and growls to the effect that, God damn it, he says, I wish I had more men like you. And he puts the Purple Heart on John's dressing, salutes him, and walks off. And John asks one of the doctors and nurses, Who was that? And they said, Oh, you don't know? That was General Patton. So John came back to New Rochelle and was very active in Veterans Affairs. And that was. That was basically his story and uh, what he was doing that particular December 7th morning. Another man, uh, Lorenzo Dufo, he was uh, an orderly in a uh, army veterans hospital in New Orleans the morning of December 7th. And he had a son, he had a three, four year old son. And when he heard about the attack, he felt he had a moral obligation to defend his country, even though there was racism and horrible treatment of African-Americans. He felt that if he could somehow do his part to show that African-Americans were just as good and just as dependable, it would help his son when he became an adult. And he joined the Navy. And once again, in the Navy, he was assigned to cooking and cleaning and that kind of thing. But at that point, uh, Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, 
wanted to desegregate the armed forces. And she talked to her husband, the president, and they sort of had a bit of a meeting of the minds that they would start slow. What they would do for the Navy is they would designate one ship that would be an all African-American ship with the exception of the officers. The officers would be white, but all the enlisted men would be African-American. That ship was called the USS Bacon. Uh, and he, uh, Lorenzo Dufo was a member of that crew. And uh, he was coming up from Louisiana in uniform one day on his way up to New York. And they stopped in Atlanta, a little bit of a wait, wait over. And he's in line at the canteen to get, get some coffee. There's some people in front of him and guy in front of him gets a cup of coffee and it's his turn. He says to the guy behind the counter, I'd like a cup of coffee. And the guy says to him, we, we don't have coffee. He said, no, no, coffee. He said, you, you just gave that guy in front of me a cup of coffee. And the guy, uh, white guy, you know, in Atlanta, Georgia, looks at him, mean face, uses the N-word. He said, we have coffee for whites. We don't have it for ends. And he used the N-word. And here is Lorenzo Dufo in uniform. He said, the other problem was at that same place when he went for lunch, where they had the cafeteria supposedly for American GIs, but it wasn't black GIs. He said, you could see American officers and American GIs in there with German prisoners and Italian prisoners talking and yucking it up like they were members of the family. But he as an African-American in uniform could not go into that same building to have lunch. He had to sit outside. And uh, the Macon, went to England, Great Britain, and the first stop was in Belfast, Ireland. And he said that it was the first time, basically, that any person in Ireland had ever seen a person with dark skin. But the people were very, very reverential and friendly, and they would come over to him and ask permission if they could touch his hand. They wanted to actually see if, you know, did this color come off? He said they were invited to people's homes, these complete strangers. They were invited to local bars and canteens. They never once had to pay for a drink. And 50 years later, the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, 1995, Princess uh, Queen Elizabeth had a, a special 50th anniversary in the palace. And one of, the, one of the guests of honor were the crew of the USS Mason, the first all-American black ship in the US Navy. So that was his, his fond memory of World War II. And as he said, he was accepted more, much more gracefully by strangers in another country than by fellow citizens in the United States. And uh, that was his story. Another man from Yonkers on December 7th, guy named John Quinlan, was with his buddies, they were playing touch football on a local field. And uh, when he heard about December 7th, he looked at all his buddies and they all agreed in unison the next day, they'd go down to Getty Square and sign up for the army. So the first day in the morning, Monday, December the 8th, he goes down to Getty Square, he's waiting for his buddies. None of his buddies showed up. So he alone enlisted, he enlisted in the army air corps. And uh, he ended up being a crew member of the Memphis Bell, which was probably, at least in Europe, the most famous bomber of World War II. They did 50 missions, 25 missions, and you were allowed to go home. They did 50. And after they grounded the plane after the 50th mission, he wanted more action. So he volunteered to join the Army Air Corps in, uh, in Burma, part of the Burma Road under General George Joe Stilwell, who's also, by the way, a Yonkers native. And uh, he was shot down behind enemy lines in China. And for several weeks, he was an escaped POW being hidden from the Japanese by the, uh, by the Chinese, who at that point were an ally of us or soon to be. So that uh, was John Quinlan's story. And as I say, the stories of these men is very powerful. One man I interviewed, and in some of these cases, I will not give a last name because it's 
uh, out of respect for the family and the content of the interview. One guy, Joe, he was not a big guy. He's about five foot five, five foot six. He lived up also in Northern Westchester County, maybe Southern Dutchess County, but he lived in a, uh, in a little hovel almost. It was almost like he built it himself. It wasn't even a house. It was almost like a shelter. And uh, he also was an avid hunter. And he told me everything. <laughs> yeah, basically, you know, especially during the depression, people couldn't afford food, right? I shot, I killed, I ate. And he said, as soon as I heard about December 7th, the next day I enlisted in the Marine Corps because I knew I could kill. I could kill the enemy, no problem. He said, I would never miss. I was a sharpshooter before they had a sharpshooter. I was a sniper before they had snipers. But I was a little taken aback because I knew he had a young son. So I looked at him, I said, sir, I'm a little confused. I said, you had a young son. You would have been exempt from the draft. You, you wouldn't have had to have served. And he looked right through me. And I, I won't use the language he used, I'll clean it up. He said, are you suggesting I should have waited for those so-and-sos to come over here? No way, I'm going to kill those so-and-sos over there. And his interview was the most graphic, brutal life had, but understandable for a Marine who was in the South Pacific. He, he was at Iwo Jima. He was at the invasion of Okinawa, the bloodiest invasion of the war. And the bloodiest battle of Okinawa was uh, at Naha. He was on the top of a mountain. And uh, he's telling me how this one morning he's coming down from the battle area and he sees this dead lady on the road with this baby holding on to her. And at that point, his whole demeanor changes. He says, you know, he says, I saw that little kid. I picked that little kid up. He said, I carried that little kid all day. I gave him so much sugar tablets. I think about that kid a lot. I wonder if that little kid remembers me. Now, at that point, I had belonged to a veterans group up in Montrose. And you get new guys into the group every once in a while. And you tell them what you do, and they tell you what they do. And this one guy came in, and he mentioned the fact, and I mentioned about the interview with the veterans. And he said, oh, wow. He said, I knew a guy. He said, you'd have loved to have interviewed him. He was one tough SOB Marine. And I said, oh, I said, what was his name? And he gives me his name. I said, my God. I said, I interviewed him. He said, you got to be kidding me. He says, I'm best friends with his son. I said, well, let me do this, because the man at this point had died. Tell the son that I interviewed his father, I've got a transcript, and I'm more than happy to give him a copy of the transcript. And the guy said, oh, no, no, the father, the son, they hate each other. He said, the son, one of the happiest days of his life, I think, was the day he buried his father. And I thought, oh, God. So I waited a couple of months, and I went over to the guy a second time. I said, look, I don't want to be a pain in the neck here. I said, but do you, you think your friend might have changed his mind? He said, I doubt it. He said, look, here's his phone number. Give him a call. So I called the son up and I said, I probably shouldn't even be making this phone call. I said, but I got your name from so-and-so. We're up at the VA here. And I interviewed your dad. I have his transcript. I'd be happy if you'd like it to send you a copy. He says, you got his transcript? I said, yeah. He says, good, do me a favor. I said, what's that? He said, Bernie effing thing. And I, I said, no, okay, I'm sorry to bother you. So I waited about six months. And I called him back a second time. And I said, I really shouldn't be making this call. I apologize in advance for doing it. But I just thought I'd ask you one last time, would you want the transcript? He said, send me the GD thing. So I sent it to him. I waited a couple of weeks and I called him back. And now his whole demeanor on the phone changes. He said, oh God, he says, I got that transcript. He said, I read that thing. He said, man, all the crap my father went through. He said, and the thing that got me the most was this kid. That's not his kid, I'm his kid. But he thinks about that kid all the time. If he thinks about that kid all the time, I would think maybe he thought about me also. Maybe he didn't hate me. Maybe he just couldn't show his love for me because, boy, he said that war really screwed him up. So you never know, you know how people are going to react to war and the stories of war and the effect it has that it has on people. And this guy, Joe, before he died, said to me, because he was at that point, the designated sniper for his Marine Corps group. This was before they had snipers. 
And he said to me that he considers himself an abject failure. He said to me that he never, ever wounded a civilian. He said Japanese would have prisoners all around them, civilians to protect themselves. He said, I wouldn't hesitate. If I saw a Japanese soldier and he had 10 people around him, I'd get him in the head every time. He said, I never once wounded a civilian. But I consider him, and he, and he said, I was told by my captain that I was going to get every Marine Corps medal they had for my service. But my captain died. And I'm, I'm, I'm a total failure. I said, Joe, I said, why would you consider yourself a failure? He said, because I had promised myself I was going to get one Japanese for every star in the flag. There were 48 stars. I only got 37. So I consider myself a failure. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's just amazing how people compare themselves and rate themselves and think of themselves. So that was, that was, a, you know, that was that man's story. But uh, I was originally surprised that most of these men, when I would ask them, did they ever share their story with family or whatever? They would, oh, no, no, I don't know. I don't know here. I don't do that. And I was a little surprised at first. But then I thought about it after a couple of interviews. Historically, the first question usually that's ever asked is, gee, Dad, what did you do during the war? And with rare exception, every person I interview is a combat veteran. And uh, if you're a combat veteran, what you have to see and or do uh, it's just, it's, a civilian cannot relate to it. I had one man tell me that he signed up for the Dow. He says D-O-W, but it was not Dow Jones Wall Street. It was D-O-W, Duration of War. And for many, many men, Duration of War was 44 months from December of 41 to August of 45 when we signed the peace treaty with Japan. And... Uh, you know, if you're if you're brave enough, maybe to tell a loved one what you did, almost guaranteed the second question is going to be, "Gee, Dad, how could you do that? Or how could you watch that?" Because civilians don't realize that war is 24/7, 365. It never stops. And once you ring a bell, you can't unring it. Once you say something, you you can't unsay it. But because I had been in the Navy, I understood their terminology. And I'm a stranger. They didn't have to explain every third or fourth word to me. And almost, almost like a religious situation for these people, it was like going to confession. Uh, most of the men I interviewed, because when I look in the mirror, I don't see a young guy, but I don't see particularly an old guy. But I realize now, I just turned 80, I am now older than Virtually every single veteran I interviewed was what I interviewed. But these guys were retired. They were sitting around. They had time to think about their service time. And also, this was like 1997, 1998. That movie, Saving Private Ryan, had just come out. And that movie, I think, more than anything else, was an impetus to veterans. I, I, I don't think anything affected veterans more than that movie, especially World War II veterans. So it was a chance to just get it out. You're never going to have to deal with me again over Christmas or Thanksgiving. I'm a stranger. You let it all out. And that's basically what happened. I was in a uh, local bakery and it was after 9-11. It was a Saturday. I'm in the middle of the line. An older man came in wearing to me a very recognizable World War II cap. And uh, I got out of line went over and I said to him, I said, I can't help but admire that cap. Were you in the service in World War II? And he said, yes, I was. And I said, sir, I want to thank you for your service. And as I'm shaking his hand, he starts to tremble. He starts to sob. And I thought, my God, what have I done? The girl behind the counter stopped serving. People in line are turning around. And I said to the man, I am so God awful sorry. I said, I never, never meant to do this thing. I'm going to wait outside. So he came out a little bit later with his little bag. And I started to apologize again. He said, no, I don't apologize for a damn thing. He said, what got me so upset? He said, you're the first person to ever thank me for my service. 
And I looked at him and I said, but I said, the war's been over more than 50 years. What about your family, your friends, your neighbors? He said, no, no, he said, I'm no hero. I just did my duty. I know. He said, I'll never bring it up. If somebody asks me, maybe I'll say something, but I'll never bring it up. So I learned that day never to thank a veteran for his service in front of anybody else. It's always one on one. A few years later, I'm down in Jersey. I'm babysitting my grandkids, local 7 Eleven, getting a cup of coffee. Little man comes in with a World War II cap. I look at him, I smile, he smiles back. I wait for him outside. He comes out and I said, sir, I couldn't help but admire that cap. Were you in the Navy in World War II? He said, oh yeah, he's in the South Pacific. He was on a ship, they were kamikaze twice. He lost 12 or 14 of his best friends. And whenever I thank a man for a service, one or both of us gets somewhat emotional because we know what that service entailed. We know what the price was. And as I say to people, the war is over, but for the veteran, the war is never over. And uh, I said to him, I said, World War II from start to finish, 44 months without getting political. Here we are now in Afghanistan for a year, like, you know, 15 and counting. What's wrong with that picture? And he kind of smiled. He got into a red sports car. And I said, whoa, that's one heck of a car you got. And he kind of smiled. He said, no, no. He said, I'm just visiting. This is my son's car. I'm just borrowing until he kicks me out. I said, well, where are you from? He said, from Indiana. So I give him a salute. He goes down to the light, makes the left-hand turn. I go back to my daughter's house. And about an hour later, I realized, you idiot. You didn't ask him for his name, his phone number. Maybe he's got email. So I got in my car, went down to where he made that left, went all the way down that road, no red car, but I passed three housing developments. First one, nothing. Second, nothing. Third, there's the red car. So I park my car, I get out. There's a lady, an older lady sitting like on a veranda nearby. And I say, ma'am, do you know whose car this is? What are you, a cop? I say, no, no, not a cop. You're sure you're not a cop? I said, no, no. I said, man, I'm at 7-Eleven. She said, top of the stairs. So I knock on the door. He answers the door. I say, sir, I'm not a stalker. Let me tell you why I'm here. I interview World War II veterans. I have this little camera. Would you be willing to tell me your story? Oh, I'd love to. Come on in. Yeah, yeah. So after a few minutes, I say to the man, I said, let me ask you, have you ever shared any of your story with your son? And his whole demeanor changes. Oh, no, no, no. I'm no hero. And if he wants to know, he'll ask. And I don't tell. And I said, fine. I said, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a copy. It's like a little round pancake. In fact, I'll give you two, one for you and one for your son, if you want to give it to him. He said, okay. So I go back a few days later. I knock on the door. The son answers the door. Son's got to be in his late 50s, early 60s. And he's kind of looking at me, but the father's there. The father says, oh, yeah, come on in. He said, this is the man I was telling you about the other day. So I come in. I look at the son. I say, can I ask you one question? He said, yeah, what is it? He says, some reason why you never asked your dad about his service. Oh, no, no. If he wanted me to know, he would have told me. And I don't want to pry, and that's private. So I look at the veteran and I say, Mr. Yazerski, now that you know why well, your son never asked you about your service, would you be willing to tell him now what you told me the other day? Oh, I'd be happy to. I didn't know he'd be interested. He wants to listen. I'm happy to say. And I have it on video. And the son, he's like a transposed teenager. Oh, God, Dad, you did that? I never knew that. Oh, I wish you would tell me that. So you never know. You know. I thought to myself, better late than never. But it would have been nice maybe if they had that conversation, uh, you know, a couple of decades earlier. So that's, you know, everybody's war is, is, is different and, and they, it, it affects them differently. And as I say to people, uh, just thank them for their service because without them, See, to me, there's really no such thing as Veterans Day and Memorial Day. To me, every day is Veterans Day and Memorial Day, because every day of our life, we reap the benefits of their service and their sacrifice. Not just one day a year, but two days a year, every day. And whether we like it or not, and there's no reason that we should not like it, we're the recipients of their service, our own, our relatives, our family our way of life. So to me, uh, every day is Veterans Day, every day is Memorial Day. And that's why I really get really irritated. When, you know, like even here tonight, we have what, maybe a half a dozen people? You know, I, I think it's wonderful for you folks who are here. But what about, uh, where, where are all the other people here? Use the library and, you know, just take it for granted. Freedom is never free. And the price that some people pay is beyond human imagination.
but we're the end recipients of it. So that's my, that's my sermon for the day. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, you can just unmute yourselves if you have any questions. I want to thank Robert for giving this uh, program. It was very interesting. My father was in D-Day in Beijing, so I found it very interesting. And thank you for keeping did your in father, touch with all. Did, did your father ever share with you any of his story? Oh, yes. Yes. Good. Yes. I'm happy he got, to hear that. He, got, he was awarded three Purple Hearts. Mm. And... We, we it's know. an awful lot of mm -hmm. pain and suffering. Yes, yes. But I'm glad I'm glad he spoke about it because mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. many do not. Yes, and, and uh, ever since I was a kid, every D Day, um, myself and my whole family go out and celebrate and have ice cream Sundays in memory of D Day. <laughs> so, Wonderful. Yep, that's 70 years. <laughs> good, good. Well, that's that's certainly a very valid way to go out and celebrate a very memorable day. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thank you again. Well, you're more than welcome. Bob, I have a question. When you're interviewing the veterans, um, was it hard to get information out of them or were they willing to talk? What I would do with veterans is I would ask very, very few questions. I would just say, sir, I'm here not so much to talk, but to listen. I'm willing to listen to anything you have to say. And if you don't want to talk, that's fine too. Maybe if I could ask you just some general questions like, you know, where did you grow up? What made you decide to join the service? But I let them talk. Uh, I've got a friend of mine. There are times I want to kick him in the butt. He's a nice guy, but he's incredibly stupid. If he, he doesn't do it much anymore because, you know, the veterans I interviewed 200, I can count on one hand how many are here. And that's pretty much the same across the country. But if he were to see a man who was a veteran of the South Pacific, he'd ask him, how many Japs did you kill? If you saw a veteran of the European theater, how many Germans did you kill? I mean, that is the most insensitive, insulting question I could imagine you could ask a veteran. But it's just born out of stupidity and ignorance and an inability to try and put yourself in the other person's shoes. Uh, you know, I say to people that my grandson, he's a wonderful little kid. When he would come to visit me at the age of six, first thing he'd do would be go into the refrigerator and look for his favorite ice cream chocolate chip. And if it wasn't there, he'd be a little, a little irritated with me. And I'd say, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I got vanilla. I guess, no, chocolate chip. He's six years old. If a veteran was 18 on December 7, 1941, he was born in 1923. And when he was six years old, it was 1929, the depression. Forget ice cream, forget refrigerators. That six-year-old kid learned that day to do whatever he could do to help mommy and daddy put food on the table, whether it was shining shoes, delivering newspapers, working on a farm, whatever he could do to help get through the day, the week, the month. And they did that for 12 years, from 1929 to December 7, 1941, all during their pubescent years, their teenage years. There was no such thing as me, me, me. Everything was we, we, we family, neighbor, and by extension country. And I say to people, basic training is important. It teaches you how to use your weapon. And that is very important. But nothing more prepared these men psychologically and mentally to go forward and sacrifice 
the way they did, then those 12 years of being concerned about something other and bigger than themselves. And as I say to people, they are by no doubt the greatest generation. And I just hope and pray we'll never have a need for another generation to be as great because they, they, they just did everything humanly possible. And because of that sacrifice, we're here today. And as I say to people, and I'm, I know I'm repeating myself, we enjoy the benefits every day of the year, not just two days a year, every single day. Yeah, hello. Yes. My name is Ray May. I live in the Bronx, New York. And, and I've never been in the Army or military, nothing like that. So I uh, respect, you know, respect what you've been to, you know, and how, uh, how much you sacrificed and, you know, you was able to survive and stuff, you know. And, and I, this is why I listen to your story to, to learn a lot about, you know, our past and what's happening with our future, you know. And you say about the Bronx back then that decided to join to fight against the enemy, even though, you know, it was like an enemy being here in the States, you know, wasn't correct, but, you know, they felt the right thing to do was to protect the country that they had to try to live in, you know, come back to, and as a man, you know, and it's affecting, yes. them, affecting them physically, you know, and that part, he said, when they went to Ireland, they never knew, they'd never seen a black person before, you know, I never knew that part of all over the world, everybody knew, knew, you know, about the race of blacks that we, what we've been to, but it's, you know, show you that, you know, <clears throat> everything is not what it, what it seemed to be, you know? So I want to thank, thank you a lot. And I write, you know, I'm at the book club in the Brooklyn Library, so I would, I'd be like to, you know, get some information so I could write some, some things about, you know, what you did during World War II, how that was, and I try to write about those stories, so, you know, I mean, true stories, so. Let, let me, if I may, uh, make it very clear. Number one, I'm a veteran, but I was never, ever in harm's way. I was never shot at. And I was born in 41, so I was not at all involved personally in World War II. What these men did is phenomenal. What I did was just I served, you know, some time in the, in the service. But as I say, I was yeah. never in harm's way, was never shot at. Uh -huh. And I think because of that, all the more I appreciate what these men did for us. Okay, I didn't hear that part. That wasn't in the beginning part. Thank you. This by this hell and that story is very emotional. <laughs> to teach teach us in the future what happened in the past. You know? Yeah, I had uh, I had one man, Bill Moy, African American from New Rochelle, and uh, Bill Moy, as he told me, uh, grew up in a little league of nations. He said we had black, Hispanic. Irish, Italian, Christian, Jewish, Protestant. He said, there was no racism or prejudice at all growing up uh, in the show when I was a kid, but I was a short guy, he said, and uh, there was some bullies. So I had to learn to protect myself. He said, I became really good. He said, I wasn't very big, but nobody messed with me. Uh -huh. And uh, he, he was born uh, in 1915. Right. And he enlisted in the army and his mother made him promise. She said, Billy boy, she said, you promised me, do not get in fights, do not get in trouble. I want you to bring home an honorable discharge. And he made that promise to her. And he said he went down with his best friend, a young Irish kid, the governor's island to get sworn into the army. He got down there and they got sworn in and it was time for, uh, for noon meal. And he said, this big white, sergeant comes out and he says okay guys it's time for lunch he said the white sea first and then he used the n-word he said you ends wait till we're finished mm. and bill moy looked at this guy and he knew he couldn't beat him up but he knew he could get him on the ground and he knew he could really hurt him but he realized the promise he made to his mother and he said my god he said i looked out that window i saw the statue of liberty Mm. And for the first time in my life, I'm experiencing overt racism at the hands of my government. Oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? And he was in four battle campaigns in North Africa, Italy, and Southern France. And as he said to me, he left his anger over there. 
And unfortunately, when he came home, his mother had already died. But he was the most beloved veteran I've seen, not just in Urshel, but in all of Westchester. And we would go out every month or so for a cup of coffee or whatever. And as we're walking down a street in Urshel, people would literally cross the street to come over, shake his hand, good morning, Mr. Bill, how are you? And uh, I was able to get some men near honorary high school diplomas. And I had mentioned to him because he mentioned to me, he didn't graduate from Norishaw High School and he, he wished he had, but he, he didn't. And I asked him one day, would you mind if I try to maybe get you a diploma? He said, oh, Bob, I'd love it. But I became at that point or soon after a very active grandfather out of town. And I woke up one morning and he was like, oh my God, I just realized I forgot to follow up on Bill Moy's high school diploma. I didn't even know if he was still alive because he would have been 99 years old. I called his number, hoping he would answer the phone, and he did. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mr. Moy, it's Bob Abbott. I said, I owe you a huge apology. He said, you don't apologize to me for a darn thing. He said, but just out of curiosity, is this about my high school diploma? I said, yes, sir, it is. He said, well, just remember one thing. He says, I'm not getting any younger. I said, oh, my God. I said, look, I'll call you back. And I got on the phone and I spoke with the Board of Education, Nourishell, and I spoke with the lady, I forget her name now at the time, she was the superintendent of schools, and I told her Bill Moy's story. And within about a couple of weeks or a month, they had a special meeting at the Board of Education in City Hall, and they gave Bill his high school diploma. It was a really nice occasion. The Journal News covered it, it was just beautiful. And I waited about two weeks and I called the principal, Reggie Richardson at Nourishell High School. I said, Reggie, if Bill Moy knew I was calling you now, he'd be really mad at me because he could not be happier. But wouldn't it be great if we could give him his high school diploma at graduation in June? And Reggie kind of laughed and he said, Bob, I'd love to. He said, but you know, he's, he's 100 years old. I said, yeah, but he's 100 going on 80. And June of 2015, Bill Moy in a cap and gown led several hundred seniors onto the parade ground at Nourishell High School to a standing ovation. Mm. He got up, he gave a little talk. He basically said, honor your elders, your God. You look at an old guy like me, you think, what do we got in common? Well, let me tell you, you're the class of 15, 2015. I'm also the class of 15, born in 1915. And for about an hour, I have it all on a little camera, people lined up to introduce their sons, daughters, grandkids to him. He was, he was phenomenal. And uh, he unfortunately died just a little bit short of his 103rd birthday. And I had the honor of giving a eulogy for him at the, uh, at the Baptist Church in New Rochelle. But uh, yeah, Bill Moy was just one wonderful man. Yes, yes, yes. beautiful. And think anybody lived past 100 years and what he'd been to and everything like that, that's more than a high school diploma. Oh, yeah. you know, so that's true. Right. Yeah, he, was, he was wonderful. And he was very alert, very, very alert. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Bill. You know, it's always a pleasure hearing you. Um, and, you know, I continue to learn a lot from you. Well, I'm glad someone does. <laughs> well, as I say, I welcome the opportunity to tell these men stories. They're too humble. They're not even with us, but if they were, they're too humble to tell them. And I think they need to be told. We need to know. We need to know what, what real sacrifice is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. There's something need to be put into the school system. So. Yes. Yes. Mm. Thank you for sharing them. You're you're more than welcome.